Not gonna sugarcoat this, things are rough in the tabletop industry right now, and it seems like a lot of the game-playing public isn't terribly aware of it. Turns out, there's been cascading problems going on over the past two years, to the point of where one publisher called this an extinction-level event. So we asked our resident tabletop aficionado, Eddie Webb, to start at the beginning, explain how things got to this point, and tell us what he thinks we can do as fans to help people who make the games we love. Thanks so much to Bright Sellers for raising a glass to today's discussion. Of course, like a lot of things right now, the problems in the tabletop industry are intertwined with the coronavirus pandemic. Strangely though, on the tabletop side of things, the problem actually started with some seemingly good news, when board game sales in 2020 went up 20%. But as Eddie points out, this was actually the first domino in a terrible chain reaction. The second domino being China, where most game publishers manufacture their products. Those facilities faced shutdowns for several months at the start of the pandemic. Then they started coming back online, just as demand for more products soared, but they didn't have enough active workers to catch up on the backlog of products they had, let alone the influx of new orders. This is likely due to poor pay, illness, and difficulty maintaining social distancing on a factory floor. But whatever the reason, so many factories are having trouble finding and keeping workers that many are working at minimal capacity or have closed entirely. So, the workload keeps getting bigger, while the ability to actually make the products isn't growing to match. That knocks into the next domino, the supplies themselves, which also brings us back to China. One of the reasons many game companies print there is because the production of paper, plastic, and other raw materials is usually done there as well. What few North American printers are still around have to import those materials, which then adds to production costs. And seeing how profit margins in tabletop games are slim, adding a dollar or two to the cost of a unit can mean the difference between a company surviving or closing. Not to mention paper itself is getting hard to find, even when processed overseas, because the issue affecting printers is also affecting paper mills. On top of staffing issues, 279 pulp and paper mills in China have shut down as part of an ongoing environmental initiative. Plus, the global push to use less plastic has led to replacing plastic products with paper alternatives, meaning that there's just not enough paper to go around. And this congruence of events is what Eddie has coined the paper apocalypse. On top of all that, online shopping has dramatically increased, meaning all those cardboard boxes you're getting in the mail gotta come from somewhere. Which kind of dovetails us right into the next domino to fall. Shipping. Shipping a freight container of games now costs around three to four times what it did before the pandemic, and the shipping time is twice as long to boot. Now, a lot of this does stem from production issues, because factories in every industry are trying to get things out the door as fast as they can to meet the currently higher demand. So that also means shipping containers are filling up quicker, resulting in less shipping containers generally available for printers. Because after all, those containers are for shipping everything, and games often get lower priority as opposed to more critical products. Further, a major port in China near its toy manufacturing area temporarily shut down due to COVID, and the UK withdrew from the EU. Both those factors have slowed down shipping and driven costs up. In the UK's case, sometimes as high as 522%. These bottlenecks also mean publishers might have games sitting in ports for months waiting to ship, which means the games aren't being sold while game makers lose money in storage fees. These factors all impact a game publisher's bottom line, and often they can't even increase prices to compensate. Many times, retailers have already bought the games from the publisher to sell, so even if prices were raised, that extra profit wouldn't go back to the publisher. Now, normally to alleviate this, publishers would try to sell games directly to customers at conventions. But then, of course, that is the final domino. Conventions are only now starting to open back up, to mixed reviews, and attendance is nowhere near what it used to be. Gen Con, one of the largest gaming conventions in the world, and one of our favorites to do talks at, only had half the attendance in 2021 that it did in 2019. And gamers are still rightfully nervous about attending, but that does mean that they're less likely to try a game at a publisher's booth that they wouldn't have otherwise discovered. Of course, online conventions have filled some of the void in terms of helping people to play games, but the discoverability of new tabletop games is still low, which means those boxes of games publishers are sitting on probably won't move as much. And all this impacts indie game publishers particularly hard. Several have closed down, laid off staff, or declared bankruptcy. But even larger companies are feeling the pressure. IDW Games, which created a number of popular board games based on comic book licenses, has stopped developing any further games or expansions to focus on just delivering the products they've already committed to. Then there's comic book publishers like Image and DC that are cutting reprints of popular titles to save on increasing paper and shipping costs. And even large bookstore chains were dreading this holiday season because they didn't know if they'd be able to get enough books and games to replace the ones sold in previous months. So all that's to say that for Eddie and many of his friends and colleagues in the tabletop space, the past two years have been really hard. 
And that's of course on top of all of the other woes the pandemic has brought. And when people not understanding the gravity of this situation are complaining on social media or in Kickstarter comments about delays and shipping costs, the weight of it all can really tank the mental health of designers. Several have simply quit the industry, while others have had to scale back their online presence and their productivity just to fulfill what they previously committed to unharassed. All right, but what can we, the game-playing public, do to help? Well, one way Eddie suggests is to support crowdfunding campaigns you believe in and pre-order physical tabletop games when you can. Both of these avenues give publishers much-needed cash up front for production costs that are currently outside of their control, and it also tells the publisher you're willing to wait to get the game in your hands. Second, you can buy directly from the publisher, or through whatever outlet they prefer when you can. And finally, recognizing that publishers may have to raise prices to stay afloat, because the more money that can stay with the actual publisher of the game, the better chance they have of weathering this perfect storm of manufacturing, supply, shipping, and convention nightmares. And you know, to close things off, I'm actually going to go off script here a little bit. A ton of us, myself included, have used games over the last couple very difficult years to get us through a bunch of awful times. And what I hope this episode does is kind of show that we're not forgetting that the folks who make these games are struggling to survive as well. So I guess the point behind all of this is let's just all support game makers that we believe in and love when we can. And always remember to show kindness and understanding when there are difficulties in getting the games that we love. Thanks so much for watching. We'll come back next time, hopefully with a less depressing episode. Um, until then, I'm going to go pet my cat. I urge you to do the same or find a cat from someone else that you can to pet. Um, talk to you later. Bye. You know, all this tabletop talk really got me wanting to host a small board game night with a couple of friends. All right, time to snag some snacks, organize my Gloomhaven box, and... Oh, sweet! Drinks are taken care of thanks to our friends at Bright Cellars. Now there are two things you should know about me when it comes to wine. One, I love having it on hand for guests. And two, you could fill a swimming pool with everything I don't know about wine. But thanks to Bright Cellars, a monthly wine club that's made my process of wine selection a breeze, I'm not just picking wine based off the labels anymore. Not only do they source their wines from small vineyards from all over the world, but they also provide a super fun seven question quiz each month that gathers your taste preferences to deliver wines you're guaranteed to love. For instance, when they gave me the question about what my favorite juice is, I got to select the hilarious but accurate answer, is coffee juice. Spoiler alert, it is. Then in a few days, my custom curated box of wine shows up at my door. My favorite this month being the Post Haste, a crisp and refreshing 60% Similian and 40% Sauvignon Blanc from France that's 100% tasty as heck. Whereas Jeff just told me he and his wife really dug the Obscura Petite Syrah, a full-bodied and richly flavored California red with notes of blackberry jam and ripe plum that pairs well with roast spiced pork loin. Oh, look at you, fancy pants. Someone's been studying their wine wisdom cards. See, with each bottle in your box, they also send along a card that outlines the tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperatures, and origin. Basically, it's a neat little mini class filled with info so you can feel like a sommelier and impress your friends. Actually, speaking of friends, you can even gift one or more boxes from Bright Sellers of personalized wine, which funnily enough, while writing this ad read, Jeff and I discovered we both independently did over the holidays. So, I don't know, great minds think alike, I guess. Wink. So assuming you're of the appropriate drinking age in your neck of the woods, how would you like to get all that goodness delivered right to your door and a great deal to boot? Right now, you can get your first six bottles from Bright Cellars for 50% off by using our link in the description below. That's six bottles for just $45, meaning it's less than $8 a bottle for wine curated to your personal palate. Not to mention when you sign up, not only will your taste buds be tantalized, but you'll also be supporting our channel in the process. Cheers to your support. Thanks so much to Orioles One, Kyle Murgatroyd, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Angela Valenciana, Alicia Bramble, and Ahmed Ziad Turk for being awesome legendary patrons.